quick look at the weather forecast. You can always find more on our website at wilag.org. Thanks for listening today, and thanks for uh, tuning in whenever you get the chance on demand again at wilag.org. I'm Todd Glisson. RFD Radio Network's Jim Taylor connects rural routes for you. You can trust Jim every morning for your overnight markets. He gets up early to help keep farmers on top of their game. Here's a bit about his rural routes. I have the opportunity to cover something different every day and provide listeners with up-to-date markets, news they need to do their job and be successful, legislative issues to crop updates and weather, of course. Be it routes or routes, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com, and FarmWeek keep you connected. As you prepare for planting season, remember your neighbors. Whether you're an applicator, grower, or beekeeper, use FieldWatch to register your farm and monitor for sensitive sites around you. FieldWatch is a free, easy-to-use online mapping tool. Consulting FieldWatch is now a requirement for the -the over-the-top use Dicamba products. Communicating with your neighbors will help you protect your farm and the environment. Don't wait. Go online to FieldWatch.com. Growing agriculture. We grow best together. You're listening to RFT Town and Country Partners, connecting you with the food you eat, the Illinois farmers who grow it, and the food-related events, destinations, and lifestyles that make our state great. Welcome to RFT Town and Country Partners on a Monday. I'm DeLos Yonke. We'll go over the phone to Washington, D.C., and Heather hampton Nodal, who joins us on a regular basis, is in the Beltway. Heather, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Okay, why are you in the Beltway? What's going on in D.C.? Well, with Farm Journal Foundation, they have a farm team of farmers from around the country, and we schedule visits here a few times a year to come visit with policymakers and think tanks about how essentially we can end hunger, if that's possible, in the world and do it even more intelligently than what we are today. So right now, I am standing in one of the meeting rooms at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Wow. What part? Where, yeah. what, what is That's that? That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> is that near USDA, or, or where are you over there? Uh, closer to, right across from FBI. Uh, oh, wow. No, actually, no, wait, no. I was there. I was right across from the FBI. We're downtown. Um, in the scheme of things, it's not far from USDA, mm-hmm. but it's more to the south and um, by some of the other offices like the National Press Club and okay. things like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, uh, we may get into a little bit of that later, but uh, just uh, before you uh, left, or did, did you leave today or when did you leave and, and what did you leave from? We were setting some records with just how cool it was <laughs> over the weekend, unfortunately. Oh, I know, and that, that weather has followed here. Uh, yes, I flew out of St. Louis this morning and fortunately had a very good flight. It was good in that they took time to change the tire on the landing gear before we took off. Oh, and gosh. Did they tell right, you that? <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> We're like, that's okay. You take all the time you need. <laughs> so, and we land, we touched down in water here, too. So, but as we left St. Louis, it was the sun was shining, and it looked like it was promising to be a decent day possibly in Montgomery County, Illinois, hopefully by noon. But I've not yeah. called back home to find out how things are going right now. Yeah, there's sunshine at least around here now, but uh, I'm not sure how, how far that spreads. I would love to see the guy with a handyman jack working on a, <laughs> working on a tire on an airplane. That would You probably couldn't see that from where you were sitting. <laughs> no, but interesting, though, he came up into the – I figured they'd have all their tools on the ground, right? Right. And for some reason, he had to come into the cockpit and get something out of the bottom. I actually had a front row seat in oh. the plane, and I don't know what the orange thing was. It almost looked like a warning flag or something that wow. he pulled out, but he put it back when he was done. Okay. So he was looking we for a, anything. He was looking for a tuba for it to jam against the, the wheel <laughs> yeah. so it didn't move while he was was working yeah. on it. My goodness. Exactly. I would have recognized a hammer. I would have recognized that, but yeah. yeah. Well, this this isn't necessarily historic, but it certainly is frustrating. I assume it's just been agonizing, just waiting for any sign of of a go ahead. Have, have you turned very many wheels at all uh, in in uh, your part of the state? 
I say kind of fits and starts. There were some fields planted around us within the last couple weeks. Uh, we actually spotted some corn coming up by Raymond, mm-hmm. but that was, you know, one field and that where the corn was coming up already, and that was last Thursday morning. And uh, But by and large, people in our area have felt fortunate if we were able to even get in and maybe do some spraying. Yeah. A little bit of tillage has been done, but it's just been so wet that we we feel like we'd do more harm by trying to push it than than we would good. Yeah, compaction is that gift that just keeps on giving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not much of a gift yeah, for, but by any means. For companies that make deep tillage equipment, yes, it is. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully when you get home, and who knows, by the time you get home, it could be 85 degrees. So we may, hopefully we're singing a different <laughs> tune in a few days. So the um, the notion um, of fighting hunger, are, are we talking about on a global scale then? Yes, as we visited here with the International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, their their mission is a world free of hunger and malnutrition. So they're doing a lot of interesting policy work in developing countries primarily, but they also do consulting work. Like a few they mentioned, Lloyds Bank of London, for example, said as they are insuring products and looking at the future, they came to the Food Policy Research Institute to help them do some projections as they look at changes in our weather and Mm -hmm. other changes, global demand, trade, and so on, so that they could figure out how to forecast some of the offerings they have from an insurance side. Um, Companies like McDonald's have come to them and said, you know, these sesame seeds we put on our buns are grown in a fairly small area. What kind of impact could we possibly anticipate in that growing area of the world? Uh, They're working with NASA on some early warning weather-type detection. Mm. Because one of the questions I had raised, if, if you read papers, there's different schools of thought on, call it food aid. Yeah. You actually deliver it in food itself, and then you've got timeliness issues and supply issues and distribution stuff. Or do you try to deliver cash with today's electronic possibilities or digital possibilities? Um, so we discussed that a little bit, and no. with they're, me- they're trying to look at early warning detection type stuff to try to authorize so you can get stuff loaded on a ship earlier. If you see something's coming and get a request made and get, get the wheels moving so it's not six months down the road. Yeah. But you don't want to be accused of just throwing money at the problem either. Well, that's it. And the reality is when you study, like they did a study in eight regions that are really high conflict zones where, oh, by the way, it just happens to be the most food insecure areas in the world. Right. Okay, do you really want to send cash to those governments? Is it going to end up in food? Right. And I think that's the real honest question that we have to ask and just within our own system of food stamps and so on there have been cases i I know friends in american agri-women are a lot more familiar with the specifics on some of these but even with today's digital technology there's still opportunity for fraud for both you know givers and receivers so so to speak and so it's Again, it's a case of there is no silver bullet, but there are a lot of very bright minds that are trying to research it and figure out better ways to get things done. Yeah, yeah, I, that's those are legitimate concerns uh, by all means. If if uh, depending on where this is going, and does does it seem that so many of the rapidly expanding populations are or could be in areas that are least likely to feed their own populations? Uh, yes, I think uh, just looking at some trends today in sub-Saharan Africa alone by 2050, they're expected to double their population. So you got a billion people there now, hmm. and they're expected to have two billion by 2050, just in that region of the world, which is largely subsistence yeah. agriculture. And there's a real that's another part of the conversation was how do you track trade flows between the countries there? Uh, and they're trying to get better data. There are some repositories of data, but it's just a really difficult environment to make decisions. And, and you ask, like, a farmer from central Illinois, so why do we care? Right. Right? <laughs> and 
sometimes, especially when you're surrounded by water <laughs> mm-hmm. and 58 degree weather when you wake up in the morning. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, ultimately it does matter. It matters in terms of, from a selfish viewpoint, the more money we put in defense spending to try to quell or shape that landscape globally, that means less money for research here to make mm-hmm. us better or less resources, higher taxation here, uh, less resources that we can put into being better at whatever it is we need to do. Hmm. Uh, the other reason is we find as people become more self-sufficient, then there are lots of opportunities like with Uganda. There's an example. We have examples with Indonesia and other developing countries, whereas they've gotten better, they've actually become trading partners for the U.S., and we become their preferred partner whenever they want to import food and the types of things that we grow and the types of things we make. So there is some self direct self-interest in this along the way besides the larger, just, you know, do the right thing. Right. Well, and uh, we have a minute left here, but uh, you're not even getting into the GMO, non-GMO of about A, food production, and B, what happens if we're having shortages within our melons or bananas or berries or <laughs> Or whatever that is, but uh, that that can bring up uh, another year's worth of discussions altogether. I assume. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. When you, yes, it could. Absolutely, and yeah. you look at the role that non-government organizations could play on both sides of that issue. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, you know, people still need to eat. Sure. So, yeah. Well, that's some high-level stuff. I would. <laughs> I'd, I'd feel inadequate just walking in the room. So uh, that's I know, for a Monday afternoon. I'm feeling like, whoa, <laughs> should be tackling this at least on a Thursday. Yeah, What's going no, on? <laughs> yeah. At least give me some time here. <laughs> well, I, I I know you're running all over the place, but thanks for uh, giving us some time. We appreciate it, and I'm sure we'll talk to you again next month. Great, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, joining us this time from D.C., Heather Hampton Nodal, quite involved in agri women and many many other pursuits. Agri women's having a hemp symposium in Peoria. On Friday, by the way. Stay tuned. This is RFD, Town and Country Partners. Farm Week and FarmWeekNow.com journalist Dina Stroish connects rural routes for you. From the farm bill to crop insurance to GMO labeling, her expertise is apparent in the story she reports. Here's a bit about her rural roots. I get to meet interesting people and share their stories, and I get paid to do it. I cover ag policy and really enjoy keeping the farming community updated on these important issues. Be it routes or roots, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com and FarmWeek keep you connected. All ag. All Illinois. All now. There are a lot of smartphone apps out there, but do they have what's important to us here in Illinois? The Farm Week Now app does, and it's always at your fingertips. All ag, all Illinois, and 24-7 where and when you need it for free. Go to your app or Play Store on your smartphone, hit search, type in Farm Week Now, that's one word, and download it today. Brought to you by Illinois Farm Bureau, where we're all about farm, family, and food. Welcome to Jim Crowley Outdoors here on the RFD Radio Network. These hobbies of mine put a lot of miles on my truck. Illinois Farm Bureau members can save $500 on the purchase of a new Ford vehicle. For more details, go to ILFB.org or contact your local county Farm Bureau. Hey, back with me today is uh, my buddy Matt Cheever from Heartland Outdoors. And, and uh, Matt, you know, we were talking just, just before the show here. And I, this is a topic I think I've never, ever covered. And I'm sure with as many deer hunters as we have throughout the state of Illinois, they're going to be very interested in what you have to say. Oh, yeah, definitely, Jim. You know, you hear about all the time about farmers uh, cutting hay early in the spring and doing different things. And uh Guys running over fawns, and, and uh, it's a reality of uh, living in the heartland here, you know. But uh, there's some things you can do to kind of prevent that. You know, try not to mow trails uh, this time of year. If you do, pre-walk them. Make sure there's nothing in there. You know, take a little extra time. If you're going to do a large grass field, let it go. Give it another month or two. Let them get up for their, you know, um, four or five weeks from now, they'll be pretty mobile and they'll get out of the way. Right now, they're just pretty defenseless. They're going to be getting dropped the next couple weeks or so. And try to mow a little spot along creeks and lakes. Kind of like a little beach area. Think of it this way. If there's tall grass everywhere they have to go get water, that's a place for a coyote or a fox or anything to hide. Keep the grass. It seems like the, the does like to bring their young in there and, and kind of police them a little bit while they get a drink and things. And maybe even a little clover plot right there. But keep some areas mowed that's safely, you know, that you're not going to mow over them. That'll uh, kind of protect them from the coyotes because that's, that's a huge problem, uh, especially this time of year. 
But it's just a lot of things you guys don't think about. Whatever we protect now are those big bucks that we're hunting in five years. You can't wait for five years and just decide you wish you had a big one. You know, you got to start now. Well, yeah, that's just like everything. You know, you plant the seeds, so to speak. And if you take care um, of these deer now, and it does. I mean, management, we've always said that hunters, without question, are the best conservationists. Whether they're, they're hunters or they don't believe that, it is true. Our money, our time, our effort goes into it. And that's why animal populations are so good as they are now. And taking a little care now can really help even strengthen that herd by taking care of those fawns right now. And, um, you know, have you ever come had like a close call like your mow? and then because obviously something led you uh to this great I, I have i uh sprayed over the top of one and it went right between the wheels of the four-wheeler and it let out the squeal i thought the belt flew off the four-wheeler and this fawn jumps up runs off and i was like you know i was just i was in a hurry i was rushed i wasn't being careful if every one of us that takes one best deer on our wall and say boy i remember that hunt well what if that fawn would have got chopped up what if what if a cow would have got that one you know it takes all those to live through to be the best buck we ever get or the trophy we're after and anything we can do to improve that it's just you know it's kind of like retirement you know just don't jump into it one day and say i'm gonna quit next week you start working on it ahead of time and you start banking for the future matt thanks again buddy and we'll talk to you next week thanks jim god bless RFD Radio Network's Rita Frazier connects rural routes for you. Rita delivers passion and reliable information to listeners on the RFD Radio Network. Her radio career spans close to three decades. Here's a bit about her rural roots. I grew up on a small farm. My job today allows me to connect with people from all walks of life and experience opportunity every day. I get to talk about what I love, farming. Be it routes or roots, RFD Radio, FarmWeekNow.com, and FarmWeek keep you connected. Does the warmer weather have you itching for a weekend getaway? Take your Illinois Farm Bureau membership savings with you. Farm Bureau members can save up to 20% at choice hotels, including favorites like Comfort Suites, Sleep In, Quality Inn and Suites, with even more to choose from. Call 800-258-2847 or visit the Choice Hotels website to search all the hotels at once and to make advanced reservations. Contact your local County Farm Bureau for your discount code number. Welcome back to Town & Country Partners Radio. I'm Christina Wilkinson. More and more people are wanting to know where their food comes from. And one area that we see a lot of growth in, especially locally, is beekeeping. Beekeeper Rich Ramsey says in the past decade, the interest has skyrocketed. I think that happened probably eight to ten years ago, really. We offered bee classes 15 years ago, had uh, maybe five, six people sign up. Now we only have room for 40, and the room's always full. The last five, six years, it's been full, and not everyone's getting bees, but they're interested, and uh, we give them an opportunity to decide whether they want it. beekeeping is for them or whether they don't want to do it because it's more than a hobby now. You have to take care of your bees. A hobby you can put on a shelf and leave it, and uh, you can't do that with bees. You have to check on them periodically to make sure they're healthy. And What kind of cost is there involved in if you're wanting to set up your own hive or, um, or interested in that? Probably you should start with two hives for obvious reasons. If you got a problem with one and you only have one, you don't know you have a problem. If you got two hives, at least two hives. And that way, uh, if there's an issue with one hive, the bees aren't flying for some reason. They are out of the other. You can uh, gauge whether they're healthy or not and even move frames from one to the other or trade uh, uh, locations to boost the population. And the cost of that is anywhere from we're talking five to six hundred dollars initially by the time you get bales, smokers the equipment and the hives and the bees the bees are 115 dollars about per package then what's turnaround time for you to actually get some honey if you're lucky and you feed your bees to start with, you feed them sugar syrup so they've got a head start. Uh, the more you feed them early on to get that first hive body filled out with honey and wax, uh, you can get honey the first year. And honey is from wild plants or plants growing not from sugar water but from plants as nectar they've collected out on their foraging efforts and that's considered honey so once once you do get how, how do you actually get the honey out of the hive well, there's two different uh, methods of getting honey. You can have honey, uh, extracted honey, which is honey that's liquid, 
and you actually put frames of foundation on the hive and the bees draw that out they have wax cells on their platelets on their abdomen they make wax and build cells store the honey in those cells and they cap it when it's uh, down to 18 percent moisture they put a cap on it and those you you take those off and take a knife and and remove the cappings and then you spin it out in an extractor if you belong to a bee club usually they have one they loan out or you can have comb honey which is honey that's uh, still in the beeswax are there any regulations around the state that prevent people from having hives like in town or does everything have to be out in the country there are a few cities or villages in the chicago collar counties that have ordinance against keeping bees uh the only one i know of in the local area is chatham they have an ordinance against beekeeping because in the state of illinois honey bees are considered farm animals livestock so their ordinance says no livestock in the village well they need to pass an ordinance exempting honey bees from that ordinance bees are considered as livestock and we want to leave them there what about then um we do have obviously in the state there are i wouldn't say wild bees but like swarms of bees if you do come across something like that what do you recommend people do but if you come across a swarm of bees hanging on a limb on a on your car door wherever even on your house if there's a swarm of honey bees don't destroy them if you don't know a beekeeper call the county extension call the sheriff's department call the ag department they all should have a list of beekeepers or bee organizations that will send someone out and retrieve the bees and put them in a hive rather than kill them the swarm is just an overpopulated hive hollow tree that's got too many bees and they swarm to start a new colony that's nature's way of propagating the species they just swarm and divide into two and it's not unusual to happen uh usually a swarm is a good thing because it means those bees are healthy or they wouldn't have swarmed what about if you do get stung by a bee what are, what are your recommended you recommended that you do something if you've never been stung before by a honey bee or any bee and you get stung inadvertently by the bee if it's a honey bee it will leave its stinger in your skin uh remove the stinger with your fingernail not squeeze it with your fingers take your fingernail and scrape it out if you've got someone with you have them watch you if you have problems if you get stung on the hand and have your throat feels like it's swelling or you're having problems breathing you're having an anaphylactic reaction and you need to go to an emergency room why is it important to maintain the bee population especially here in the state of Illinois well bees are important in pollinating fruit trees and cucumbers and any other uh, vegetable crops we're not a huge producer of those in this area but up in the uh, Mason City Mason County area they have uh, they do grow vegetable crops for a uh, harvest pumpkins and that kind of thing and bees are the most efficient pollinators because they go after pollen for a reason to feed the kid some of the other bees just crawl around on the flower getting nectar and spread the pollen from the hairs on their body but honey bees that their sole purpose is to pollinate and get the pollen to take it back and and uh, feed their uh, offspring i guess we can say that bees are well-rounded creatures providing us with a great product honey and also helping pollinate other vegetables that we like. For Town & Country Partners Radio, I'm Christina Wilkinson. Thanks, Christina. Always good stuff. Tomorrow, Joe Berman at Country Financial with his regular discussion about financial planning and a Bridge the Gap event in Quincy. I'm DeLaw.